Whelan Presley and Van Ho Funeral Homes have been serving Quad City families and veterans for over 100 years. Whelan Presley is located in Rock Island, Milan, Reynolds, and Van Ho in East Moline, proudly supporting WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities. Illinois lawmakers return to Springfield in the coming days. Could there be changes in how the state taxes and spends? A question impacting the pocketbooks of many people in the cities. Illinois received an early Christmas present as reports came out that the state's revenues were better than some expected. But the state also has unpaid bills, pension fund deficits, and lawmakers who see new opportunities to invest rather than return taxpayer money. Democrats remain in firm control of both houses of the legislature as well as the governor's mansion. So what's on the agenda? We talked with Western Illinois State Senator Mike Halpin, who is also chairman of the Rock Island County Democratic Party, about priorities accomplishments and failures. Let's talk money, because when you talk about Illinois government, it's all, always about money. And the uh, governor's office of management budget projecting a $1.4 billion in added revenues. That's a sweeter picture than you had a, a expected, right? Uh, you know, it certainly is, absolutely. I, I uh, expected increases now that we've got a lot of our debt payments down, but that, that number is um, certainly encouraging and the, the current fiscal year numbers are also encouraging. So tell me about that. I mean, why is it encouraging um, at this point for Illinois government? It's encouraging because we were um, trying to put forward conservative budgets and conservative estimates, paying what we need to pay uh, for services that our citizens want, uh, but at the same time, uh, making sure that we weren't putting a lot of new programs in that we couldn't sustain long term. And we were doing that under the assumption of certain revenues coming in over the next several years. With uh, that revenue coming in at higher numbers than we anticipated, it means we might be able to do more within those existing programs, continue to pay down additional debt. It just gives us a lot more flexibility when we're discussing legislation in next year's budget. So tell me where we are, because let's be honest, 10 years ago, Illinois was in such a deep hole um, as far as paying uh, uh, bills, its pension fund, uh, the budget just being out of whack. Yeah. The payback has been gradual, but it was really accelerated over the last four years. Where are we right now in Illinois? So we're at a place where our bill backlog has gone down from about uh, 16 or $17 billion down to a 30-day uh, payment cycle. Uh, on any given day, the oldest bill that received by the controller's office is like maybe 10 or 12 days old. So people are getting paid which also makes people want to do business with the state again because they're not going to have to wait uh, several months to get paid. Um, we've paid back all the interfund transfers, all the budgetary gimmicks from those years before um, I got there where we borrowed from ourselves to make it um, uh, look right on the balance sheet. We've paid that down. We've paid off our group health insurance debt. We've been making extra payments to the pension system. So we are now in a position where uh, we have eliminated a lot of the structural um, uh, impediments to a balanced budget. And now we can focus on how can we provide uh, tax relief, how can we provide housing assistance, how can we provide additional health care. Uh, all those things are, are now on the table that uh, when I started seven years ago, we couldn't dream of, of tackling that because we had that mounting debt. How much is that thanks to federal you know, income that's coming in, COVID uh, uh, relief funds? I mean, that was a billions of dollars. And it was certainly helpful at the height of the emergency, and it was most helpful, I think, for the local governments, our counties and cities, that those dollars flowed through the state down to. Um, but the controller will tell you that the bulk of the debt and other items that we've paid down uh, during that time was primarily relying on, on our priorities as a state and the state funds that we put towards it, and, and maximizing uh, federal matching dollars, things like that, in order to get the debt down. At this point, we're almost entirely uh, 
uh, free of, of federal assistance. Our, our budget assumptions are uh, no additional um, COVID or public emergency related funds coming into the state. So we are, you know, uh, assuming on our own. We're not assuming anything is going to be given. Well, when you look once again at the Office of Management Budgets projections, they're looking for a surplus in this fiscal year, which ends at the end of June. But is forecasting for 2025 a deficit almost the same amount as the surplus is? Um, yeah. Is that worrisome because because the gravy train will be over, so to speak? Uh, it's it's only a little worrisome in the sense that uh, no one wants to project a deficit. But I do think we have been not just in this uh, future forecasting. But over the past several years, we've been very conservative in our revenue forecasting, so we don't go too far or try to spend too much. And I think that's the case here. What we're seeing in FY24 is higher than expected revenues, and I think we'll hopefully see higher than expected as we go through uh, towards FY25. There may be a small hole that we uh, need to address, but the other thing I would mention is we're now over $2 billion in our state's rainy day fund. Uh, I think when I took office, we might have 60000 in the bank for, for rainy day fund. So we, we have prepared ourselves if there is a downturn and we start to see increasing pressures on the, on the state side. Of course, critics will point out that Illinois is among the highest taxing states. Um, that's a reputation. You may be paying your bills, but you still have that reputation. Well, I've heard for the past four budget cycles that our budgets are unsustainable. <laughs> We've been sustaining them and additional, uh, you know, uh, additional revenue has been coming in. We've seen unemployment down still at historic lows. Um, we've seen uh, more people uh, able to find jobs. Wages are going up. Uh, you know, home home prices are going up. You know, value is going up, uh, even here in the in the Quad Cities. So there are a lot of positive things going on as a result of our budget. I understand that Republicans feel they need to, uh, you know, uh, downplay everything we do, uh, but the reality is things are moving in, in a, a better direction than we were four years ago. You take a look at the other state that's just to the uh, west of Illinois in Iowa, where they're discussing eliminating the income tax. Um, I mean, that's, that's a pipe dream for Illinois. Yeah, I think, you know, we need to lower taxes for the people that need the relief the most, the working uh, and, and middle class. Um, we're uh, trying to do that by lowering property taxes through our education uh, funding formula. But the reality is, in order to provide services that our citizens tell us we want, we have to have some sort of revenue. We don't have oil the way Texas does. We don't have a lot of uh, the type of vacation industry that Florida does. So we need to all share that burden if we want to have good roads, uh, good public schools, and the, and, and the like. So it's a trade-off, and we I think we're in a... Uh, a good place. Let's talk about education and let's start with higher education because we're in studios that are at Western Illinois University. Mm -hmm. uh, Western Illinois University and all of the public universities took such a massive hit during those two years of a of frozen budget, fightings between uh, Governor Rauner and the Democratic uh, legislature. Students started flocking to other states. Uh, some, some professors just gave up after years of teaching. That's something that takes a long time to recover as well. Yep. What do you see as as far as you're seeing the status of the public universities here, um, because we're seeing some improvements in enrollment, but perhaps not fast enough. Yeah, and it's going to take some some time to get back to where we were. We you know we put record investments into our MAP grants to let low and middle income students uh, go back to our universities. Uh, we put money in for capital to make sure uh, take care of some deferred maintenance that has been accumulating. What I, what I do caution folks, I'm a member of the Midwest Higher Education Compact as the Senate appointee, and we, we need to make sure that we're not using enrollment numbers um, as, as the, the perfect level of whether a university is successful anymore, because nationwide there are just fewer high school students total, and that's going to, that demographic change is going to continue over the years. So we need to make sure that our universities are robust enough to take care of the student population that they have, try to grow it where we can, but really emphasize uh, quality programs that graduate students from Illinois 
and then back into Illinois where they can work. A lot of people, though, do use enrollment figures as the litmus test, and yeah. people question whether or not the brick and mortar facilities are even needed anymore, especially after the pandemic and so much uh, online experience. And other people saying, I can't deal with the burden of college, so they go straight into the workforce or whatever. Um, does Illinois have to rethink? its public education system for, for higher education? I think every state does. Um, the type of students that you're talking about are the out there and they're becoming a larger portion of the, the student population. Um, and I think we need to have institutions that can serve them. At the same time, there are some folks that will be more successful by having that in-person environment uh, that may not do as well uh, uh, online or remote and really need the, the support services in person that our universities provide. So I think there's a model for both, but we need to make sure that, that we're incorporating it and each institution is um, uh, playing to their own strengths. K through, 12, uh, K, K through 12 schooling in Illinois got one of the biggest budget boosts in its history in this last budget. How do you see that paying off? Uh, I think it's a, gonna continue the trend where we're um, putting the resources into the schools that we need to so we can focus on uh, STEM folks, uh, getting them into into jobs that, uh, that are there. Uh, I think it's going to help uh, pressure on teachers, make sure uh, we can hire teachers, schools can afford, um, you know, to maybe offer higher wages for our, for our teachers, which have kind of been um, stagnant. They can do more things that they couldn't do when we were having that significant pressure and we weren't really funding it the way we should have. One of the big investments is also for uh, pre-K, uh, mm -hmm. preschool, and the uh, Smart Start Illinois. Um, the governor has made it pretty much his hope that every child who is a three or four years old is eligible or capable to be in a preschool uh, by 2027. Yeah. Um, is that still a reachable goal? I, I think it is, but we're really going to have to bear down and do it. Um, we need the facilities. We need the staffing. And right now that's where the shortage lies. And so we need to incentivize that and make sure that uh, every area is covered. It's still, I think, a feasible goal, but it's gonna take some significant effort to get there. Now, and, and I'm not totally familiar with the program. Is this pure government, or is there some way to make it a public-private partnership because so many businesses benefit from you know, preschool or childcare? Yeah, it's certainly a, a public and private in the sense that uh, these the facilities, whether they're a smaller home facility or uh, larger, like some of the ones we have in, in the area, um, you know, they're private enterprises, whether they're nonprofit or, or smaller or for-profits. So they are partnering, uh, it's government uh, assistance to be able to um, uh, get, get families that need that access the most into the, into the facility. Um, they're certainly, we're certainly open to uh, partnerships with private companies if they want to participate that when they specifically know it's gonna benefit their employees. That is something I'm certainly open to. I'm sure the governor is as well. Western Illinois University here in the Quad Cities kind of expanding its childcare education services. Is that critically important for the future of the state is to get, as you said, more workers into that field? Yeah, it, you know, anything we can do to speed up the timeline from getting someone who has an interest in serving these kids through to their licensure, we should be supportive of. Um, uh, it's a big bottleneck that we're gonna have to get through if we wanna meet those goals. You alluded to uh, the minimum wage a little bit earlier and on the first of the year, the minimum wage went up once again. It's now, I believe, $14 an hour and also an increase, I've got it here, there we go. Tipped worker wages increased from seven eighty dollars an hour to $8.40 an hour. Um, you know that this is a, a graduated uh, incremental growth uh, until the state reached $15 yep. an hour. And back when it was first discussed, I think two years ago, it was, it was, oh my gosh, how do you do this? And you're seeing businesses all across America already hitting $15 an hour, if not more. Um, should the graduated increases be sped up or, or is it something that you think that when Illinois did it way back two, three years ago, it, it, you were on the cutting edge? I think we were on the cutting edge and, and I would have at the time liked to see it uh, get to 15 faster. Uh, but I understand the challenges related to that. Because when you, when you see the inflation over the past couple of years, that $15 an hour, you know, that purchasing power has already dwindled. Um, so I, I'm glad that we did it when we did it. I'm glad that we're on a path to giving everyone another raise uh, uh, this year and as well as next year. Um, I think we were on the cutting edge. I think private companies are seeing that they have to pay 
uh, you know, very competitive wages to get good workers. And um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing those workers benefit from all this. The other big issue that people have been talking about, of course, is crime. Uh, whether, you, whether you paint society as more violent than it was in the past, or whether you say that uh, police aren't doing the work they're supposed to do. Illinois is trying to tackle it as best as possible. Controversial bill, of course, as you well know, that was passed. Yeah. Um, and also the uh, entire uh, um, registration of assault weapons, which is now being challenged in federal court. Last time I talked to you about the assault weapon registration, it had just gone into the court system. You said that's the word should be. It should be settled in that way. Yeah, I think the, the question is going to be resolved one way or another there. And then once that comes down, uh, we'll be able to f figure out how to move forward. That's just like the, the Safety Act last year. You know, the courts decided that it was uh, uh, perfectly constitutional. And so we're implementing it. And what we haven't seen, of course, is the, the purge, as lots of uh, uh, detractors said back, back then. What we've seen is a uh, kind of reasonable approach by local states' attorneys and judges to, to get through the process of uh, pretrial hearings. Um, we haven't seen a large uptick uh, in crime here locally. Overall, I mean, uh, we're still at historic lows when you compare uh, to, the, to the 90s and, uh, or even back as far as the, the 70s. So I think we have a good community here. Uh, it's a good process in place. And uh, we'll just have to, if there are issues that come up here and there, we'll have to address them. Uh, but overall, I think uh, we're in a general good place. What are the merits to, if you have an assault style weapon, what are the merits to registering? I mean, what difference does it make? Um, you know, so what the, um, I think what the uh, legislators that were uh, most fully promoting it would say is that, um, uh, if, if, it's, if it's registered uh, and then there's an incident, it's a lot easier to track down. Um, uh, and I think it's a lot easier to um, prevent, future, uh, prefu prefu uh, prevent future weapons from getting into uh, folks' hands that shouldn't be uh, carrying them or that are dangerous people. Do you think so? Yeah. I, I, think that, um, I think that a lot of these weapons are not uh, not meant to be carried around in the general public. I think they are dangerous. Um, I sometimes wonder whether we're focusing on the right f uh, uh, people that are carrying. A lot of the folks in this area that have these weapons rarely even shoot them. Um, at the same time, my house, former House colleagues failed to pass a bill that would have uh, put more serious penalties on repeat gun offenders. And I think that that um, dissonance or that, you know, that, that doesn't make sense to me. What is so worrisome is, of course, gun violence, and you think of gun violence in schools. Um, and I go back to uh, thinking of uh, um, all the times that all of the security measures have been put into schools and a person's just able to take a gun and blast their way in. And a lot of times these people might have some mental health issues, but not necessarily a big criminal record. And so, mm -hmm. It's, it's a societal issue, and, and you've, you know the phrase, guns don't kill people, people kill people. So where do you get at the root of that problem? I mean, do you invest more in mental health? And if you do, how do you get the people that need that mental health the help they need when either their family could be in denial or, or certainly they could be? We've seen in the state and actually across the country that you know, mental health services and and intervening with people before they reach a point where the whatever trauma uh, they've experienced has, has pushed them that far. Um, we, we've nationwide have a problem with that. And as we get our fiscal house in order here in Illinois, we want to continue to see increased uh, resources put into that. You know, we've increased Medicaid rates. We've done additional uh, uh, legislation to provide for increased access to telehealth, which helps rural communities. Uh, uh, a lot, and we need to do more of that. Uh, we need better um, uh, residential facilities because that is a, a huge lack um, uh, of beds here in the state. Uh, so there, there's more work to be done. I think we do get bang for the buck out of it. Yeah. One other area that I thought was interesting that, that went into effect in the first year was something called the Grocery Initiative Act. Mm -hmm. uh, the Grocery Initiative Act is designed to reduce food deserts. Very important, I would think, in, in, in metropolitan areas like Chicago. But how does that impact the Quad Cities? Because there are food deserts here as well. Yeah, it happens everywhere. Um, uh, it's a, a different problem for the, for the city than, mm -hmm. than rural. 
um, but we still have them here, not just in, in Quad Cities, uh, but throughout the rest of the 36th district. Rural towns um, don't necessarily have that, that small grocery store they used to have. They're reply, relying more on you know, Dollar General or other dollar stores to get groceries, which isn't always the, the healthiest option. Um, so what this can do is allow um, for grocery stores to go into places that might not otherwise be economically feasible, and whether that's city or country. Um, and so I'm, I'm encouraged that um, we'll get some local partners here that'd be interested in doing it. Uh, again, not just here in Rock Island County, but throughout the, the whole uh, 36th District, Western Illinois. So we're heading into the very beginning of 2024, the session about to start. Okay. What, what, what are your priorities for this coming year? Well, I think uh, every time I've been here, my first top priority is the budget because of the, <laughs> that's where yeah, I was. Exactly. Um, but I think you know that's a uh, it's become an easier and easier discussion lately. Uh, so I'm pretty confident that we'll get to a budget that uh, meets our obligations and our priorities for the year. Um, a couple of the other things I want to work on is um, additional services for uh, domestic violence prevention. Um, we're continuing to see that as a, a problem that just isn't going away. Um, I want to focus on resources for homelessness um, uh, and mental health providers as well. Because the all, governor all, also all introducing a major homelessness uh, uh, initiative. I mean, how do you see that being? I mean, it was welcomed by people who have to deal with homelessness day in and day out. I mean, have mm -hmm. you seen any uh, positivity from that yet? Well, yes, and actually, just just today, I was at a ribbon cutting uh, at, at Moline Housing Authority for their um, uh, new units in Moline and sponsored in part by the Illinois Home uh, Initiative, uh, getting people uh, to uh, places where they're safe and affordable and accessible home uh, for them. And that's just one small part of it. Uh, we're seeing that, that those kind of dollars as part of the program go throughout the state. And we are, uh, we are doing fairly well uh, on that. We're making progress, but it's still a long way to go. Purely political question, you being Rock Island County Democratic Chairman as well, you're taking a look at the Iowa caucuses that are dissolving in front of our eyes right now. What does it mean for Illinois to perhaps move up its primary date or to become a bigger player in presidential politics? I, I would love to see it. Uh, Illinois, just demographically, is, reflects the nation better than any other state. We look about, uh, talk about our, our racial and ethnic diversity, our geographic diversity, you know, urban versus rural. Um, we have we are a microcosm of, of the country, and if we were to be able to vet uh, candidates the way that the state of Iowa had for a long time, I think we'd be in a position to be able to say to the rest of the country, this is the type of candidate that, that we should be electing. Argument, though, is that it's a very democratic state. Well, so but if you're talking about uh, caucuses or primaries, it's, the, it's those folks that are nominating, and, and the Republicans would have that same opportunity. Because mm -hmm. the Republicans in Illinois, uh, I would assume, reflect the Republicans on the national level, and then the Democrats represent the Democrats. So uh, we're, I think Illinois is actually uh, pretty well positioned in that regard. Our thanks to Illinois State Senator Mike Halpin, Democrat from Rock Island. The session starts January 16th in Springfield. Lojo Russo has been very busy with concerts throughout the area, but we got a chance to meet up with her for a new performance of one of her originals. So here's Lojo Russo with The Secret. A lot of my songwriting is based on snippets of melody that kind of run in my head or something that I say and then I realize that's got like a rhythm to it, a scansion, and I'll kind of play with that rhythm a little bit and see if anything else grows out of it. More often than not, I'm playing around on the guitar and just kind of popping through some different stuff and this little pattern on the guitar starts up. Put it on the sidewalk, pick it up, down in my pocket, give it up. Reaching out to a stranger in a hand, never near trying to understand.
wrote a song based on a book I never read, The Secret. But I knew the, the premise of it, the overarching idea of putting good out in the universe, and the universe will bring the good back into your life. So that's, that's the secret, trying to remember that negativity is a waste of time. Um, you know, giving up, a, you know, finding a penny on the, on, the, on the floor and picking it up. But when you see somebody in need, you give a dollar back. It's, you know, it's, it's not this one-to-one -one kind of give and take. It's always trying to just give and give and give and remember all the good stuff that we are thankful for. So. Lojo Russo with The Secret. She's set to take part in the Songwriter Series coming up Thursday the 18th at the Galena Center for the Arts. And on Friday the 19th, she's set to join the cast of the Bucktown Americana Music Show, formerly known as the Bucktown Review. It's at the Nice Wanger Theater in Davenport. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device and streaming on your computer, thanks for taking time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Presley and Van Ho Funeral Homes have been serving Quad City families and veterans for over 100 years. Whelan Presley is located in Rock Island, Milan, Reynolds, and Van Ho in East Moline, proudly supporting WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities.